Good afternoon, or maybe good evening, everyone. Um, I hope and I see that there are people joining at this moment. So we take just a little couple of seconds to really start this webinar. Well, my name is Janine Kaspers. I'm the international RDX instructor, um, and I'm happy to be the host of this webinar um, of today. Um, I have the opportunity to introduce Professor Wynne Janssen. He will do the presentation. Um, at the end, I will do a live demonstration in Century Suite how to use um, artificial intelligence. Um, during this presentation, maybe you have some questions. In the bottom of your screen, you see the Q&A option. Just type in your question, and if we have the time and the opportunity, we will answer them directly, or maybe just at the end of the presentation. So again, thanks everyone to join us in this new uh, artificial intelligent tools for efficient management or of PFT workflows. Um, I will give the word to our, um, uh, our other kind of host for today, Professor Wim Janssen. Thank you so much for having the time uh, to do this webinar with us. No, thank you. And thanks uh, to Vayar uh, for the organization. Um... I'll share my screen in the meantime. Just now. So Janine, is this okay? All right. So uh, again, thanks for um, the kind invitation and to give me um, the opportunity to present some of the concepts um, that we've been working on in our research group at the Leuven University in Belgium. Some of them in collaboration with Arctic um, over the last, let's say, decade. Um, before we start, maybe important to mention that I'm also co-founder and shareholder of Arctic, um, which is a spin-off of the University of Leuven and that I received grants from a variety of companies, as well as consultancy and lecture fees. I think that there is no doubt in general that acute, but also chronic respiratory diseases are one of the major health challenges in the future. We've seen this with COVID and we know this for many years. It is estimated roughly that chronic respiratory diseases account for 12.5% of the global mortality and that they associate with a yearly estimated cost of 380 billion euros. And so despite the observation um, that lung function is often criticized for its limitations, I think, and I'm completely convinced that it remains the mainstay for the evaluation of the respiratory system and a cornerstone of clinical practice. In general, spirometry is believed as a cheap diagnostic test that is quite accurate, that can be easily implemented in primary care. And in secondary and third line care, spirometry is often accompanied by long volumes, diffusion resistance, to evaluate or to give a more thorough evaluation of the respiratory system. And for the sake of this talk, I will refer to complete pulmonary function test by using the abbreviation PFT, which comprises pyrometry, body platysmography, um, with or without resistance and diffusion capacity. So as I said, the complete PFT is comprised of different maneuvers selected by highly standardized quality assessments um, based on international guidelines and then acceptable reproducible measures give access to different lung indices that are compared with reference values of matched healthy peers. And so in total, we have about 70 different parameters. We have different curves and this needs to be um, interpreted in a clinical context of um, the patient in front of the clinician. And so in 2013, we evaluated the contribution of four common pulmonary function tests, so spirometry, volumes, resistance, and diffusion capacity, and their individual role 
in coming to a final diagnosis. And we found that in 1,000 patients who admitted for the first time to a secondary care practice, that in 77% of cases, a correct diagnosis could be made based on the clinical history, the clinical exam, and the complete pulmonary function test. And so the validation came then by all the tests that were deemed necessary to come to a court of gold standard diagnosis. So 77% of cases can already be diagnosed with complete pulmonary function tests in a clinical context. If you look at spirometry, this is about 65%. Then the other tests like diffusion volumes adds to 77%. And obviously there are cases in which PFT is only one part of the puzzle and with which you need additional tests to really validate to come to a final diagnosis. Still, the interpretation of PFT, in my view, is time consuming. It is definitely expert dependent. It is variable and not always specific. And these drawbacks can potentially lead to misdiagnosis, redundant additional tests, and increased costs. And so one of the solutions may come from a more homogenous interpretation strategy defined by consensus decision trees based on validated ATS ERS guidelines. And so we did this exercise in 2017 based on a Pellegrino decision tree that dated from 2005 on the Belgian pulmonary function data set that I previously mentioned. And we found that in only 38% of the cases, we could come up with a correct diagnosis. When using, however, CART diagnostics, which is a, a sort of machine learning approach to make data-based dichotomic decision trees, we reached an accuracy of 68%. It's a major improvement but still 10% away from what human experts panels could deliver when they had access to clinical history, as I said, and complete pulmonary function data. An additional complexity that we're currently facing is that in the meantime, also the rules change. And so the rules have been changed dramatically by these new interpretative strategies guidelines from ERS ATS that was recently published in ERJ. And we won't go into a detailed analysis today on how these PFT needs to be interpreted, but more importantly, focus on the concepts that were raised in the paper on how you should interpret PFT data. In general, there are four stages in PFT interpretation. We have to collect high quality data, then compare them with good reference data. And it is nowadays GLI reference data or enhanced in US, and then describing the underlying physiological or pathophysiological phenotype. And most likely it's severity, which also uh, um, is part of a good protocol in practice. The fourth step, however, to place this test into a clinical context to add other investigations such as laboratory, CT scan, and to come to a final diagnosis or at least reduce your differential is not really part of protocoling. But as you see, and as you probably have experienced in your own practice, this transition zone is rather gray. And in some cases, particularly now with the diffusion rules, highly specific labels can be generated. The 2022 guidelines have made a major shift in the interpretation strategy as compared to the Pellegrino decision tree. First, I think it's fair that obstruction now is being labeled and confirmed again as a spirometric diagnosis based on a ratio FEV1, FEC, that is below the lower limit of norm. So no longer 0.7, so below the lower limit of a good reference population. Secondly, it's been recognized that spirometry is not there to diagnose restriction, mixed pattern, or a typical pattern for which you need long volumes. In fact, you need TLC, not only VC or FEC, to diagnose or exclude restrictive diseases. This was a practice that in 
many hospitals around the world was already used, but was never been stated as such in the Pellegrino guidelines. Thirdly, the rule-based approach also defines new patterns further down the, uh, further down the tree by distinguishing on the right side here, complex restriction from simple restriction and by defining in case of obstruction, hyperinflation or air trapping and distinguish this from normal or large lungs based on RVTLC ratio. So a bit more of granularity and together with Arctic, we apply these new decision trees on a data set of 1400 subjects with a confirmed final diagnosis based on all the tests that again deemed important and necessary by the physicians to come to such a diagnosis. And to program an automated protocol, which is rule-based, we composed a combination tree, which is in line with the current statement paper. And you can see that we first start with looking at FEV1, FEC ratio, and then as stated, use TLC to distinguish obstructive from restrictive and um, uh, mixed patterns. When comparing the 2005 guidelines with the new programmed interpretation rules, some major shifts occurred. And you see, particularly in the normal group, we identified more restriction because this was no longer dependent of FEC, but of TLC. We also defined within the obstructive cases an atypical pattern and in the restrictive cases, a clear differentiation between simple and complex restrictive. So 30% of simple restrictive or restrictive at the time became complex restrictive. And very important is now to look what type of diseases we identify in these new clusters. And you can see that in um, the normal cases that were previously considered as normal, ILD could already be identified in 87% of these shifted cases to simple or complex restrictive. So based on TLC, we also see that that non-specific pattern is no longer a group that is composed only of obstructive diseases because it was used to be an exception in the ats -ERS statement, but it's now labeled as a specific, and it's indeed a specific because half of this is a mixture of uh, several diseases. And then also the reason to split simple from complex restrictive diseases makes sense as you see that simple is mostly composed of ILD, whereas complex restrictive is um, composed either of ILD, neuromuscular disease, there is a bit of thoracic deformity in that. So again, a pool of disease labels that came up. And so in addition to the labels that you can provide by rule-based protocols, we also hypothesize that AI-based algorithms would even be better suited to link PFT data with the clinical context for a respiratory disease diagnosis, or at least provide somehow a probability estimation for a certain diagnosis, as this is exactly what human intelligence is supposed to do in clinical practice and so copy pasted by the computer. And to explore this hypothesis, we developed an A-based solution where we use the clinical data set of the Belgian pulmonary function study comprising and with additional cases of speci um, or, or of disease specific labels, of 1,430 patients visiting the outpatient clinic in Leuven for the reason of respiratory complaints. The final diagnosis, so the reference diagnosis, the gold standard, is again based on all tests available and was approved in this study by an expert board. And so the AI model was trained on more than 1,500 subjects of whom we had more than 70 individual PFT features available, as well as some clinical information, such as BMI, gender, age, and pack years, to develop and train a model and then validate the model um, on its output. And the output that we generate based on such an AI-based algorithm is so not longer only a long function protocoling, but also a disease probability estimation and some further recommendations, um, which I won't detail. And so compared to the poor 
um, rule birds disease labeling according to the Pellegrino tree, we had a random forest model supervised machine learning to that pointed to the right diagnosis in 74% of the cases, which was confirmed in an independent internal data set of 136 other individuals. And so this results almost equals what we have when we ask physicians in group to score diseases based on clinical data and complete lung function um, data sets. We then went to an external validation, um, comparing the performance of the AI-based algorithm with human readers. And for this study, we asked 120 pulmonologists from 16 different European-based hospitals to score a complex variety of PFT from um, a mixture of clinical cases, which were representative of what we see in clinical practice. We had some asthma, some COPD, healthy, interstitial lung diseases, pulmonary vascular disease, neuromuscular disease, other obstructive diseases, and thoracic deformity. Meaning that those 120 pulmonologists together provided 6,000 interpretations um, that we looked at, a cure, that we considered to determine accuracy. And so when comparing the overall performance of our clinicians with the performance of the AI software, and so the overall performance of every individual center is depicted here in red. It is interesting to see that the computer scores almost double the accuracy um, of the individual clinicians. With no extreme differences between the centers, no differences between junior or experienced physicians, the only thing which was striking was that we had a low kappa coefficient, meaning that there is a large between subject variation on the scoring skills. So the more it was interesting to see that for ILD, for instance, for pulmonary vascular disease, for other obstructive diseases and thoracic deformity, we almost had a 100% positive predictive value. Similarly, we found very low negative predictive values for the physician that clearly improved with the computer predictions um, depicted in green again um, for healthy COPD, ILD, neuromuscular disease. So a really no number of false negative cases. And so this was published by Marco Tupalovic um, in 2019 in the ERJ in which he concluded based on these results and some other findings that an AI-based algorithm is able to detect different classes of respiratory diseases, obviously, but that it's more rapid, more accurate to individual clinical interpretation, and that it may potentially support clinicians and trainees in their clinical daily life practice. And so based on these data and the available algorithm, the company Arctic was set up with the main objective to provide worldwide access to automated lung function protocols, as this already exists for more than a decade for ECG recordings, um, for instance. And so in the meantime, through a collaboration with VIRE and Assertis, we've protocoled now through this system more than 90,000 PFT cases in Leuven. And so the question is obviously, is this is just a gadget or whether this is really true help in clinical practice? And so when looking at this case, for instance, and I let you a few seconds looking at the data, I think that most of you would immediately link this case to COPD. And that is obviously because of the flow volume loop with the kink in the curve, in the forced expiration, you have a low a ratio, hyperinflation, and low diffusion capacity. And indeed, COPD came out as a suggestion of rule-based protocoling, and the probability estimation of 66% was given by the computer-based protocol, so the AI-based estimation, confirming our clinical suspicion. So no real deal, no big added value for a routine clinician. 
But looking at this case, by contrast, where you see a bit of restriction, both on spirometry, reduced TLC, with low diffusion and a supranormal KCO, this becomes more complex. Maybe not for you, but I'm sure that there will be more doubt to identify this pattern that perfectly fits in the context of a neuromuscular disease, a thoracic deformity. And indeed, this patient had the unilateral diaphragm paralysis, a diagnosis that may be certainly overlooked by non-experts in my view. Secondly, and a question that is probably more difficult to tackle, was the feedback of many clinicians that once you have not sufficient trust in AI, you perceive these protocols, AI-based protocols, as a sort of black box. Moreover, as this is a diagnostic support tool in some cases, it would not be unacceptable without human approval or overreading if you do not correctly understand what an AI estimation really means. And to tackle this question, um, we uh, made use of a different strategy. And the strategy was to develop um, a double approach. On the one hand, we used Shapley additive interpretations, which is a machine learning post hoc methodology that pinpoints to the factors that contribute most to a diagnostic decision and which can be individualized per case. In fact, these values somehow open the box and disclose why certain predictions are being made for an individual case. And in the case I show here, you see that the computer came to the decision of COPD because of a low ratio, a reduced KCO. It was what counterintuitive and counter evidence of a low number of pack years, but again, with the reduced DLCO and the increased age, the computer decided that the probability of um, COPD was highest. And that's why he pointed to that as the first diagnostic option. Secondly, we developed an online exercise, an online study in which we compared the physician with the physician who has access to these diagnostic AI-based protocols with explanations. We call it explainable AI. And so by doing so, we compared basically a physician working in his office with a physician working together with computer support tools, which is probably more corresponding to our future approach. And this study was executed in two phases, one monocenter and one multicenter European study, in which we again provided 24 cases to um, 16 use at Leuven, uh, a monocenter pulmonologist study, and um, 62 pulmonologists from 13, I, I think it's 14, um, different hospitals in Europe. And again, the final diagnosis was approved, adjudicated by um, a board based on all other tests. So cases were given um, to these clinicians on a guerrilla platform to which the physician was asked then to give his preferential and a list of differential diagnoses, first without support and immediately afterwards with support. And so the support, as you can see here, was depicted based on Shapley um, additive explanations that provided positive or negative evidence for the given two most likely diagnoses. And the clinician also had to score based on a five item liquor scale, how certain he was on um, a certain diagnosis or a list of differential diagnoses. As previously stated, the experiment was organized in two sessions. So one monocenter, 16 pulmonologists, and then um, a multicenter replication with different 24 PFT cases um, in a second round, resulting in total about 800 and almost 3,000 paired interpretations to make our analysis. The primary endpoint was the number of correct preferred diagnoses. Key secondary endpoint was the number of correct differential diagnoses, meaning a diagnostic list that contained at least the gold standard diagnosis. 
And as you can see on the left-hand side, the data of the single center study, on the right-hand side, the multi-center, as you can see, the primary endpoint significantly improved when adding XAI to the clinician as a help. And also secondary endpoints significantly um, increased um, to um, almost containing the final diagnosis in 95% in of cases. And this was exactly copied in the multi-center study. We also looked at the number of cases in which the differential or preferential diagnosis changed. And this was observed in half of the cases. So in half of the cases, the clinician modified his interpretation based on the AI suggestion. It was mostly by reducing the differential diagnosis. And particularly, we found it striking to see that these changes occurred most often and significantly higher in cases where they had an initial low confidence in their own diagnosis. Together with some other findings, interesting observations, we concluded that the collaboration between AI and pulmonologists improved the accuracy of PFT interpretations. And we were very proud to see this publication being accepted and is currently in press in the, UR, in the European Respiratory Journal as well. And I, I have to express my gratitude to all the co-authors and the participating centers. So in conclusion, I hope that I was able to convince you of the potential of rule-based, AI-based protocoling of pulmonary function tests. In my opinion, it will definitely help to standardize interpretation and potentially help, maybe not you, but definitely non-experts for the interpretation of PFT, resulting in a faster, more early diagnosis. But be aware that automation does not overcome the necessity of good quality measures. And that if you introduce broken eggs or bad data, that you only will result in scrambled conclusions. And allow me to refer to some other studies that we've developed and that demonstrate that in the nearby future, probably we will also make use of computer algorithms and AI may decisions um, to guide clinicians for optimal quality selection. And I refer to a recent publication of our research group on the development of a deep learning algorithm to select acceptable and usable lung functions based on an enhanced data set. A strategy that has been recently proven effective by Arctic and superior to the clinical overreading in data of randomized trials. So also there in the selection of quality AI seems to have a role. And so with that, I leave you with my final take home messages for tonight or to start the day in the US. I think new ATS ERS interpretation guidelines incorporate more complex pattern classification, more granularity that may link to different clinical disease classes. I think that AI-based diagnosis is derived from complete PFT and minimal clinical input are more accurate than individual clinical interpretations. We also show, and this is very important, that the collaboration of physicians with AI post protocol functioning improves their diagnostic workup. And finally, I think that by the integration of rule-based protocols with AI-based disease estimations, VIAR may offer the ultimate solution for a better lung function interpretation. Thank you. Um, I need to thank, obviously, my sponsors, my, my, my institutions, and all my collaborators, in particular, the people of Arctic and the people um, of FIRE. And I'm looking forward um, to answer your questions. Thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Jensen, to have this nice presentation. I see that there is uh, one question. Um, we'll have all the uh, questions answered at the end of the last part of this webinar. Um, so you already see it in the chat, but you see at the bottom of your screen, there is a little Q&A uh, button. If you click there, you just can type any question you want. If we have the time and the answers, we will uh, answer it live in this webinar, or we take the opportunity to do it via an email. So, um, 
we have also the opportunity to have a live demo and uh, I will show my screen now. I hope everyone now sees the Century Suite desktop. And so uh, Professor Janssens, can you just confirm that you see my screen? Thank you yes. so much, thank you. Okay, of course we don't have a complete live demonstration that we also do the measurements. In this case, I already have some uh, Arctic demo patients. So here in Sensory Suite, we have two options. We can search for the patients. In this case, I'm going to search in my own database for the Arctic demo patients. Now you see, I've got four patients. You probably recognize also the patient A uh, name. If I double click, I will open the patient or I just click on select. Now I see that this patient has performed a spirometry, a body box and a diffusion measurement. It can also be very important to import the pet years. You can see here that I got a questionnaire smoking. If I click on that one, I can have the option to have it as a no visit. So that is directly a patient info. And I can type in any kind of pack years and all the questions I can answer. In this case, in this demo patient, the pack years are uh, 34. So I will save the data and I just pretend that I've done all the kinds of measurements that we need to do the complete interpretation. And I can go directly to current patient. For this demonstration, I already created a Century Suite uh, example report. If I just see here, these are the visits. In this case, it was a visit done um, in 2021. If I just click on the report, I can see, and this is just an example report. Of course, it can be uh, built up any way you want it to build up, but I have an overview with the parameters. And in this case, I also got some graphs you probably recognize. It's depending on the version of Sentry Suite. In this case, for this demo, we use the 320.5. There we have directly the um, icon for um, Arctic. If I just click on that one, it will take, and in this case, because my Wi-Fi is not that good, but it directly creates a report and it will create um, a comment field. This comment field can be directly implemented in your own report. So you see that there is a part directly in the comment field. If you look at the complete Arctic PFT report, then you see the same like the moderate obstructive lung function. There is also the disease probability. It's not with a nice fancy bar, but it still tells the same information here. The only thing that you can also see on the interpretation is the conclusion and the suggestion. In this case, it's the same demo patient. That was not um, something that we knew uh, before we start this one, but you see it in the COPD. I only need to save the comment fields. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Hi, sorry to disturb you. Um, we don't see anything on the screen. You don't see anything on the screen? No, we just see the Sentry Suite but uh, the Century Suite homepage, but we don't see anything. Okay, then I just stop sharing and I start sharing again because I didn't do anything different than last time. Sorry for that, by the way. So this is still only the homepage. Do you see it moving now? Yes, now it's moving. Okay, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You see also now the review part? No. It's not moving with? Okay, then there is something. Just let me, because we did it before. Then I do it like this. Probably this will work. Do you now see the screen from the review? Okay, perfect. I already did the demo. I'm sorry that you couldn't follow it. Um, normally you just click on the Sensory Suite report. In this case, it's a sample access report. I'm just checking again. Do you see that the report is opening? 
Perfect. Thank you for nodding. There is also some delay in my screen, so there is something strange. You see now, uh, there is here a little icon, and you see that there is a pop-up that um, if you click on that one, the Arctic PFT report will be created. In uh, this example, uh, because I just already clicked, you see that here is in the common fields, all the same stuff that you see here on the Arctic PFT report. You see here, the text is the same. The disease probability is not with a nice bar, but it's just only by text. And you see the conclusion and suggestion. So now I just close this one because I already saved that one. And we try if the next one has more success. So I go search for the patient again. I search for the Arctic demo patients in my system. And I will go now directly go to patient B. I can again, if necessary, I can add the pick here. This patient has smoked for five pack here. So save it to the data, say, okay. Now we go to current patient because then I directly go to the visit of that patient. And just double checking again, you still see the correct screen, I hope. Um, now I also have already yes. um, created this, thank you, says example report. So I open the report. Normally you just, oh, oh well, I already had that. You only just look at the data and you can just type in anything you want. Or in this case, we use the Arctic interpretation. So now you see, but only with one click, the complete interpretation and I also got the Arctic PFT report. That is in this case, it's only for demo. Um, still, it's the same information. It's also the disease probability, like you see with a nice bar, only you have on the report also the conclusion and suggestion. So you can see it's only a couple of clicks. I can do just one more. Again, search for the Arctic patients or you have normally in your daily workflow, you have your current patients. Select your patient in this case. I go to the current patient because I need to go to the review. And my laptop is giving me some issues. Sorry for that. Open report. So that is only. Also one click, the report is generated during one of the measurements. And I just can click on the Arctic icon. Now my laptop already demonstrated that it has some issues. So in this case, it takes a little bit longer. It's not because of Arctic, but it's because of my, uh, my laptop in this case. Again, there is the interpretation and directly there is also the Arctic report. So I see that we got a couple of questions. So I will go back to my homepage and stop sharing. And let us see if we can answer some questions. Maybe Professor Janssen, you already looked at the questions. Mm, then, nope. 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 <laughs> no problem. Yes. I, I see a question from uh, Kaylee Schbat. Can AI replace pulmonologist in future? Interesting question, but I think you're the best person to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a, it's, it's, it's even a philosophical question, I think. Um, my answer to this is that AI probably will never replace clinicians. Um, definitely not for complex tasks. Uh, we always would need clinicians um, that check and double check AI decisions being made. I think maybe AI will replace clinicians on very redundant um, tasks in which they've shown to be even superior than um, a board clinician. But if we talk about complex tasks, um, 
interpretation of multiple data set, I think that the answer to this is that we're going to collaborate. And that is exactly what we've shown with the exercise, that if you get support, that is maybe more of help on a bad day of you than on an average day, that that type of collaboration is probably superior than your individual um, interpretation. But that may be very variable to the setting. It, it's really dependent on, 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 on the clinical practice in, in what type of data you have access to when looking at clinical long function data. In, in some cases, it's only about protocoling and interpreting. In other cases, it is the patient in front of you with immediately access to the complete long function data. I mean, this all makes differences. And, 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 and to make a long answer short, will never be replaced, will be always needed. And that is also why, for instance, in, in the wire, um, you have the possibility to change the protocol. Eh? AI is suggesting you something. Um, it's making a protocol, but you have the freedom to, to make of this your own protocol in case you do not agree. Yep, I, uh, I completely agree. So there is another interesting question. Is there a plan to incorporate Fino and iOS results in Arctic interpretation? So. Uh, um... Talking about there, future plans, maybe. Yeah, well, that's a, that's that's a, a great idea, and um, it's definitely one of the ideas we have been evaluating. The problem with Fino is that um, what you need is if you want to add this, huh, because I totally agree that in a clinical setting where you add, for instance, laboratory or Fino eosinophils, that it will be very helpful to make a distinction between asthma, COPD, maybe overlap, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem here is that we need to rely on well-validated large data sets. And that at this stage um, with Fino, it's even hard to make normal values. Huh? Um, so the GLI initiative failed in, in, in defining what is normal and beyond the normal limits or the normal confidence interval. So, I think it will be hard, but it is definitely a step forward that you do not only take into account PFT data, but start to add other data, radiological data, um, blood sampling, um, other long function tests uh, to, um, to make a more accurate diagnosis. And in the end, I mean, then you would just replicate what internal met or pulmonologists will do. Perfect. And uh, also about iOS, so the impulse oscillometry. Yeah, or I, th yeah, yeah I think that is, a, that is a good idea. I think yeah. um, definitely in combination with spirometry, looking for maybe not all the different patterns, but there is definitely room for the combination of maybe spirometry, iOS um, in yeah, distinguishing between the most common diseases yeah. in my view. And I think we'll have access to those data sets with well-validated labels. And I think that is probably um, um, more easy to achieve as with Fino, in my view, because in the there future. Is more data are available. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely not tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> then there is another question. Um, is AI taking in account the quality of the measurement? Think about the curves, because you already said, if you have just broken eggs, um, then you just get a scrambled egg and not the really good result. Yeah. So, yeah, that is that is a, a, of utmost importance. Eh? That we we start to look at the data once we are certain that these are high quality data. And um, I think that definitely for spirometry, the deep learning algorithms that have been developed are offering superior quality um, and are even superior to the human overreading. Uh, as we saw in, in, in different trials. So they will be able to provide immediately feedback um, to the operator in selecting the appropriate curves. I think in the home monitoring setting, home-based spirometry, these of, 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 of tremendous importance and they're having access to tools that help you to select the best quality is, is, is of, of definite value. Um, 
But then again, also with um, volumes, diffusion capacity, there's many mistakes that, 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 that can occur. And I think at this stage, we still rely on that expert technician and we probably need to do for a longer time. Not that I have not, that it's not possible to, to maybe develop something that can be of help in that area as well. I mean, there are some common mistakes that can be easily captured by a computer on the performance of volumes, on the performance of diffusion. We even had a project here at the university together with the people of Toronto, of Sanyas Stanojevic, um, on multiple bread wash out, but we there failed in, 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 in beating the human overreading uh, for multiple bread. So, so an area that is under development and, and, and we'll see. Yeah, so, but it is a combination of the first questions. Um, it can't replace pulmonologists, but it also can't directly replace a good technique. No, no, no. no. Um, let me look at the questions. Um, there is also, but I think this is kind of already answered, but I will ask it. Uh, will it take into account other symptom input, such as cough or dyspnea in calculation of disease probability? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, and 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 we thought actually, and um, that those the discrimination of symptoms, uh, whether this is coughing mainly or um, breathlessness or sputa, that this would be a major contributor to the diagnostic decision. And so we had the CAT questionnaire in the data set available, but it turned out um, not to be useful actually, because all patients admit somehow with the complex uh, a bit difference, but 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 in the end with high CAT scores and 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 were symptomatic on the different axes. I think clinical info can still be a very important um, um, denominator. Um, in terms of how long is the disease existing, is there exposure, and, 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 and some other things that a clinician usually takes into account uh, in, in coming to, to a diagnostic decision. If you have started smoking for, for just one year, you won't consider COPD, for instance. I mean, so those type of, of, of fine tuning is obviously missed um, by uh, an algorithm, but in the end, I, I would not overestimate it's important as well. Yeah. No, good. Um, another question. Um, in the future, and we're talking about the future, it's a combination. We had the Fino and the iOS. In this case, um, Consuela, they, she's thanking you for the presentation and ask you if in the future there will be also something for CPEX or mm -hmm. iOS, but iOS we already answered. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah, we're we're working on this. I, yes. I think this is something in development, and I think there is definitely need, uh, also need um, for CPAT interpretations. Um, the difficulty there is that we have so many different uh, uh, guidelines which yes. do not agree on how to make uh, these diagnostic distinctions. That this needs to be set first before you can start asking the computer uh, to learn also, from like this. Yeah, also like the predicted values are completely yeah, different. Yeah, predicted there. values are missing, but they're probably less important than the patterns that we mm -hmm. see appearing. So this is a project that we're currently working on, and I hope to have um, something um, within the next coming years. Yeah, so people know that there are more nice things to come, probably. Mm -hmm. um, there was another question about the interpretation of the CPAT, but we already answered that. Um, there is, uh, um, this is also the same. There is only for spirometry diffusion and lung volumes. So is there MIPMAP, PINO1 or provocation like a metacoline provocation? So I think we already answered that um, yeah. this yeah. is a continuous yeah. story. It's not stopping with only the spirometry diffusion and the body box measurements, um, but yeah, it's depending on the data. And it's depending on all the guidelines and everything, if they're yeah. available or yeah. not. Yeah. yeah, indeed, indeed it is. Um, this is all, uh, also a question. Can you tell a bit more about AI and checking the quality of the PFTs? As you already pointed out, quality is extremely important for the interpretation. Yeah, I think we also already 
uh, discuss. Well, I, I can I can maybe give a bit more insight in this actually right. that what we did um, was it is a deep learning um, approach on on the curves. So we had access to all the curves of the patients that uh, were followed in the enhanced population. So the raw data and then. Um, the algorithm is able to identify disturbed patterns based on the curves. So it makes a combination of these rule-based decision points. I mean, the end of test criteria, the um, back extrapolated volume, the length of, of the, the breeding time. So all these are rule-based eh, um, selection criteria that are normally used eh, to, to, to adjudicate for quality. But on top of this, there is that sort of clinical um, interpretation of the curve, a cough, eh? a, a slow a hesitation, for instance, um, um, an, 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 an insufficient inspiration. And this is being captured now by these deep learning uh, views um, on, the, on, on the curves and, and is of added value and replaces almost what the, 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 the technician adds to these rule-based eh, um, quality assessments yeah. and together then you perform at least as good as an expert technician uh, in interpreting the data. Well when people are using the sensory suite software and they have the settings based on the latest guidelines they always get pop-ups and they have the information if they are really following all the quality checks that is implemented in the guidelines so it's a, a, a perfect combination. Yeah, well, it's not yet there eh, in Sentry Suite, or it's not available, that deep learning approach? Is no, 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 not that, but it's we already, yeah. because the guidelines are implemented in the software, yeah, yeah, you yeah. can see in for trial if you are just following yeah. the guidelines or not. Yeah. So it's an, yeah. if during the, during the test, you already can see if it's, um, yeah. is, is it the best possible way to do the test for the, this patient. Uh, the other question, um, I think we can both answer it, but I leave it to you, is uh, Arctic a cloud solution? Yep. So do you need a network or could it be applied offline? Um, I think you should ask Arctic. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, so for, far as I'm concerned at this stage, I think it is only cloud-based. Um, it is. And, um, but obviously, I mean, there could be settings in which cloud is not uh, something that is available to a large community that they can think to plug it in on, 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 on a software. But at this yeah. stage, how it's provided is through cloud-based. Yeah. Huh? Um, so, and if they want to have more information, they can just ask yeah. one of the fire people yeah. as well. Yeah. And then we can connect them with Arctic. Um, can Arctic still be improved, give more uh, accurate outcome if clinical data could also be taken into account it's the same. That means if there is asthma in the family, um, any uh, allergies yeah. or dyspnea complaints. So yeah. I think, yeah, it's... I, yeah, I, I, that's a very fair question. And I think that there is still room for improvement in certain disease areas. I think with COPD, we're almost 100% correct, I think. And that is also obvious because, I mean, it's a very specific pattern. And, and so with ILD, we also have reached high accuracies. And we are having a model that is able to early identify disease that is often even missed by non-expert views uh, because of subtle changes in spirometry in combination with volumes and diffusion capacity. The, the, the main question and the main difficulty is still with asthma. And that is obviously because asthma is not a spirometric nor long function diagnosis, it's it's more on clinical. Uh, you can have a perfect normal spirometry or lung function and still have asthma. And so that's why the computer misclassifies in, 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 in some um, cases asthma um, and, and does not recognize, does not pick it up. But you can never ask something to recognize from lung function data if the diagnosis is not based on lung function. We're even not able to diagnose lung cancer equally. I mean, uh, so there is some premises to be taken before you use this in clinical practice. It won't solve all of your problems. <laughs> and, 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 and luckily, so it won't replace you. <laughs> exactly. And it's only just to support the diagnose, the lung function test. Yeah. More than it's to completely. Um, I think this is also a similar question. It's about the quality of the test. Does 
uh, IA disregard sessions uh, of B and C grades and overrides the technicians. Well, I don't. Well, yeah. We have it available, but it's not yet implemented in the VIA equipment. But there is developments being made in Arctic so that you get immediate feedback um, once you perform a maneuver um, and, and, and that instructs you to the second um, maneuver. Um, to improve quality and, and, and to come to better quality, which is particularly developed for home-based settings. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And again, it's when you have the latest version in Sensory Suite, we also have the latest guidelines there. So you can directly see if um, a trial is an A, a B, or a C. Um, yeah. and so you really can directly see before you do the interpretation with the Arctic if you really have proper data. So it's yeah. a perfect combination again. Um, we still have some time left. Um, were patients of different races included? When do you uh, anticipate AI to be used clinically for PFT interpretation? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there is a, a two sides in the question. I think, uh, can we just replicate what we've developed in a European setting to uh, completely different region eh? where also the prevalences of the diseases may shift. Um, the answer is no. Eh? You probably need to validate this if you move to a completely different setting. I'm not telling that in the US, I mean, this is probably exactly the same. There is probably some shifts with the, the body mass index and, 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 and some other factors. Um, so in, in that sense, yeah, you should always be aware that you cannot just, without any checkups, double check, uh, copy paste something that has been developed in a different setting. With race, this is this is difficult. I think the impact and there is a bit of literature on how to look at race in terms of GLI um, reference equations and and is this really an important factor? Um, yep, I. I think there might be differences in race and again, more alluding to differences in the prevalences of the diseases that are affected by race. Um, so um, yeah, good question. And I have no, no direct answer um, um, to solve it. Yeah. Another nice question. Uh, will it provide a probability on full PFT only or can it interpret um, spirometry only? Yeah, yeah. Um, we have currently developed something that is just looking at spirometry. Obviously, you cannot ask them to give to come up with the same granularity, so it will never be able to recognize neuromuscular or thoracic deformity patterns, which are really dependent on volumes and diffusion. But like the most prevalent diseases, um, such as asthma, COPD, distinguish this from restrictive and probably allude to um, um, earlier diagnosis of ILD is, is available. We're also testing this, um, or Arctic is testing this in, in large clinical primary care settings to see whether it helps GPs, um, which we consider as less expert in looking at the data, um, um, whether this is of help uh, in coming to a more early diagnosis in a better um, um, identification um, uh, case finding. In, 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 in different settings. Yeah, so if the PFT testing is more complete, then you have more uh, accuracy. Yeah. And if you just have the spirometry, it's still very useful. Yeah, Only you yeah can do absolutely. And, and, and I nice. think in general, what we showed with the Belgian lung function study, the most important message to me is that spirometry only uh, helps you with clinical data um, to come to um, 65 percent of an, ac an accurate diagnosis, a first diagnostic guess. Huh? So I think this yeah. is COPD. You don't need the other test, basically. Huh? And then you're almost uh, right in two thirds of the cases. Yeah, nice. So that is also like another question. Can you use AI for interpretation when you are missing, for example, uh, DLCO measurement spell. I think that yeah. it's the answer is yes. You yeah. just answered it. Um, is this AI based on the GLI predicted values? Yeah. We didn't mention yeah. that directly, yeah. maybe, but yeah, it is. And it's also uh, just some explanation on the sensory side. Even if you use another predicted 
uh, module in Century Suite, um, AI is still using the GLI uh, predicted values. So it's not using the predictors that you are sending to AI because the report that is sent is only with the measured values. Yeah. Um, so we have that one. We do still have some time. Um, different results. Um, let me see. What this is a nice one. Uh, because you already explained that spirometry already gives you a lot of information. So there is someone that asked the question, what measurements give the highest accuracy if you cannot do all? So you start with spirometry. So if you have more benefit of doing the body box or the diffusion. Yeah, yeah. That is also something that we checked in that, in that study, uh, um, um, the Belgian lung function study that was published in the Lancet, respiratory medicine. Um, what is the added value of all these tests? And, and we actually um, um, designed that study to prove that even resistance measures uh, with platysmography were of added value in reducing the differential and making a more appropriate diagnosis. Because at that time, we performed the study. This was hard. It was really questioned by the, the, the authorities. And they said, we don't want to reimburse it anymore. And so we designed the study to show, hey, look, these tests really matter. And so obviously you start with spirometry, 65%. And then if you add resistance, it comes to a significant shift, but not so impactful to, I think it was about 68. Then you make a shift of 7% with volumes. And then again, a, a big jump with diffusion. So I think spirometry and diffusion probably are the most important ones. And that is because diffusion and, and particularly the, re, the relation with VA and KCO make a lot of difference in distinguishing um, chest wall problems um, from, from, from underlying lung diseases, actually. And, yeah. yeah. So the more measurements, the more complete. Yeah, the more the, more the better. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and as it can all be done in one hand, I mean... Yeah. We then it will be perfect. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So then I see there is only just one question, um, but we already answered that. Um, can it be used with any other predicted set? So yeah, you can use the Sentry Seed software yeah. with any other predicted sets, but AI is using the GLI uh, predicted. So I think we have all questions answered. If your question Great. is not answered, we will send you an email. So, um, um, so I think we have all the questions. Maybe there is someone who's thanking us <laughs> for our time. Well, mm -hmm. you're welcome. It was very nice to do this session together with you. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. all your knowledge and that you shared all the information and have a little pleasure. Uh, peek view to the future. <laughs> that is also nice. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we can thank everyone um, for joining us in this webinar. Um, I think we learned a lot, have a lot of more information about AI. Um, if you have any questions and you didn't want to ask them during this session, you can always send your via uh, person an email um, or just to the global um, email uh, your, your questions and then we will take some time to answer them. So I think we have all the questions done. Um, we still have some, just to double check. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. You're welcome, everyone. So I think we can close this webinar uh, for today. Um, hope you will join another web webinar we are organizing. And again, Professor Janssen, thank you so much for your time this evening and your uh, pleasant uh, presentation. Yeah, okay. with pleasure. Thank you. Have a good okay. evening. Good evening, everyone. All right.